Discerning Hearts provides content dedicated to those on the spiritual journey. To continue production of these videos, prayers, and more, go to discerninghearts.com and click the donate link found there or inside the free Discerning Hearts app to make your donation. Thanks and God bless. DiscerningHearts.com presents The Heart of Prayer with Father Amon Bork. Father Bork is a priest of the Archdiocese of Dublin and has served as vocations director for the diocese as well as pastor in a number of its parishes. Trained as a spiritual director in the contemplative style, he now serves as chaplain to the University College Dublin, the largest university in Ireland. He is the author of Make Your Home in Me, Reflections on Prayer, Master, The One You Love is Ill, Reflections on Illness and Caring for the Sick, and Mercy in All Things, Reflections on the Diary of St. Faustina Kowalska. The Heart of Prayer with Father Amon Bork. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Welcome, Father. It's so good to be with you again. Welcome. It's great, wonderful to be with you too again, Chris. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be with you today. Before we get started more in the area of prayer, I wonder if you might share with us what the experience of prayer has been like for you as a chaplain of a of a large university of of dealing with those who are young and just beginning to come to a fuller awareness of their faith and that relationship with God. I suppose the first thing to say for me, it's been uh, an incredible privilege working with students. I'm here for the last six years, and the last six years have been an extremely wonderful blessing in my priesthood. I've been so encouraged, and my faith and my priesthood have been just um, given a new lease of life by the, the love and the faith and the commitment of young people. I suppose the most important thing to say from my perspective as a priest, that I'm called to be a spiritual father to the students. And for me, the students on this campus, we have 32,000 students here on the campus. But for me, they're not students, they're my sons and daughters. So when I go out on the campus each morning, I'm concerned about their well-being, their welfare. I'm concerned that they're going to do well. I'm particularly concerned about their emotional and spiritual well-being, that they, that they will have all the support that they need to address that which always brings me back to making sure that I am what I've been called to be as a man of prayer, because we have so many support systems in, on the campus for academics and uh, psychological supports and me medical supports. But really what students are looking for me as a priest is that I'm a spiritual father and that I am a priest that prays. And if I'm not praying, then I'm no use to them. I, I can't give anything to them. Um, because my ministry has to flow from a heart that's already connected with God. I have to walk the path of God before they do, so that I can show them how to get to God. It's no point me just saying, giving them guidance and prayer, and in this is how you do it, and this is how it happens. If I'm not doing it myself, because I have to walk the path before them so that they can follow on, and that they, I can, in some ways, navigate a path for them and give them the guidance that they need from experience. Um, so that, uh, because I suppose each person's spiritual journey is unique, obviously, but there are certain characteristics of the spiritual journey that you know are universal, also. But as I really want to emphasize, is that as a man of prayer, I'm called to be one who prays every day and who is able to walk with them and stand with them and pray with them. The most wonderful thing for me is when a student comes and says to me. Uh, I can't pray or I don't know how to pray or my prayers bogged down and like I need a bit of help. You know, that's where I come in um, to just give them a little bit of guidance and encouragement along the path. What do you suppose is the stumbling block or the thing that causes not only them, but you or I or anyone out there that's listening right now, the thing that causes us to just to get stuck you know, sometimes I say to my own kids, I mean, I, sometimes I feel like I'm walking through the La Brea tar pit. Every movement seems so difficult sometimes. Right. Well, one of the main things that gets people stuck is that um, not being, not to know how to pray, you know, and how to uh, approach prayer in the first place. I remember being in the seminary and when I was in the seminary, we were placed before the Blessed Sacrament and we had to sit there for three half hours a week that was what was encouraged us to do but they never told us what when you sit there what you do so i was looking at the blessed sacrament and, and reading books and 
tried to distract myself for the half hour because I didn't really, uh, nobody gave me the guidance I needed to actually say, well, actually, when you sit before the Blessed Sacrament, this is what you have to do, you know, or this is what you're encouraged to do. So I think the first step is giving them the basic tools of how to approach the Lord and um, where to start and how to start. And then once they've started, then you can start negotiating then the maybe the pitfalls. Another pitfall is really they're living in a very secular society now, in a very secular college that is actually quite difficult. Uh, there's a certain isolation in people who want to remain faithful to God and faithful to the prayer life. And they sometimes see themselves as the only ones who are trying to pray or the only ones who are trying to, uh, to do anything in this spiritual way. So there can be a certain isolation as well around it, and that can be discouraging for them too. I suppose the third thing was probably, especially if you're trying to struggle with prayer on your own, is all of us get bogged down in certain ways because the, the spiritual relationship is not is not just linear. It's like any relationship. It, it grows or it weakens depending on the, the amount of time and effort that you give to it. And sometimes we give a lot of time to it. Sometimes we get distracted and our time is taken up with other things. So we don't give the time we need to it or else the Lord is drawing us deeper and deeper into prayer and we're not able to sure how to respond to that. And we sometimes draw back. So there can be a lot of different reasons why our prayer life can be um, maybe get bogged down, as you say. But I think the key to it is at least initially giving them the basic tools of how to pray. Well, I think one of the problems in Ireland, and I'm not sure if it's in the States, if the case is that, and I even for myself, before I really took prayer seriously, and well, I meant to, I always tried to take it seriously, but I was always often bogged, bogged down myself. A lot of priests are afraid that a person might come up to them and ask them how to teach them how to pray because they haven't maybe negotiated that themselves properly. So there's a challenge for not just for myself, but all priests and all sisters and all brothers and all members of the church to really take prayer seriously so that uh, when people are young, people come to us especially and say, look, how do I pray? Or how do I continue praying? Or how do I grow in my prayer life? That we're all open and all joyful that we've been asked that question. Part of it, in some ways, and we've discussed this before, is just being real with God. I think that can also be similar to, as we hear from so many of the great spiritual masters of our tradition, is the humility that we need to see ourselves as God sees us. Um, sometimes I've heard this phrase, Father, that we see our sin, but God sees our pain. In a real way, being those areas of sinfulness, uh, the areas where we know we've fallen, just being real about that with ourselves, because God can see that, and he sees the pain that drives us into that sin, doesn't he? Absolutely, and I think that's one of the key things that people often don't see, equate the two, that, that when, as you say, when we see sin, God sin, sees pain, and that can be an obstacle for young people, because... Young people are especially, uh, well, not just young people, we're, all, we're living in a world of temptation. We're living in a world of distraction. We're living in a world what, that doesn't want to delay gratification and wants everything today and now. And we want our own way and we want things to go the way we want them to go and our plans to unfold the way we want them to go. Um, so we are bogged down at times in, in our own sinfulness and especially when our sin maybe has accumulated from lack of, of confession, and particularly because confession I probably universally has lessened and especially attendance at it. So if people haven't been going to confession regularly and the sin mounts up in their life, they can actually feel themselves to be in a state of being unloved and unlovable. That God, like, how could God love me now after all that I've done? And why would God be interested in me because of my sinful life? And, you know, I've done too much damage to my spiritual life that, you know, I've blown it almost with the Lord, you know. So it's even come into the recognition that, look, nobody... Nobody is finished with God's love. God is love. God can't stop loving us. That's just the bottom line. And, and especially as we are his children and he sees our pain, he's actually moved with more compassion than we can imagine. Um, I'm not saying that the greater the sin, the greater the compassion, because God is always equally compassionate to all his children. But it means that he, he definitely does see the extent of our pain and, our, and he doesn't reject us or draw back from us. If anything, he just wants to enter into the mystery of our pain and to heal it and to remove it from our from our souls so that we can be free again. So there's a sense that if we could only recognize that our sin is not an obstacle, actually, but actually probably our way to holiness, that if we allow the Lord in to touch us in a deep way through um, accessing our sin, through 
confession and through prayer and being honest with God about what, what really is going on in our life, that actually that can be the conduit which God's grace can enter our hearts in a real and precious way. We had a retreat recently for students and um, we had a talk on confession. A lot of students went to confession afterwards. But one particular student was really moved by hearing himself speak the words of, of his sin and and then hearing the words of, of forgiveness and mercy. And like he was embarrassed about his sins and they had been built up for over a period of time. And I suppose there was anxiety there and there was shame there and there was embarrassment there. But when he heard the words that you are forgiven, it was just a, a transforming thing and knowing that God has completely forgiven you of all your sins. So actually uh, the recognition and the honesty around our sinfulness, especially towards God in prayer, as I said, can be really the access point of God's extraordinary grace into our hearts, and it can be enough to change our lives. The reality is, isn't it, Father, that our sin, they are the results of the choices that we make, and that we need to be able to take ownership of. That These are the choices that we made. However, there is our forces that we have to be aware of as well that tempt us into that. We have a, a tempter who wants us to follow a path that will lead us to destruction. And oftentimes it will be lined with a lot of it will, everything that looks very good in some ways yeah, to us in the absolutely. moment. And we don't talk about that. And of course, that's the enemy, the devil. I mean, for whatever reason, a lot of times we don't want to give that reality a place so we can reject it. Well, absolutely. And I think the, the one person who speaks about the devil and its influence more than many is Jesus himself. And we know during the readings, especially during uh, Lenten time, that Jesus was tempted by the devil in, in the in the desert when he was after 40 days of fasting. So we know that the devil exists from, from it's very scriptural. And it's, um, we saw the encounter, as I said, with Jesus and the devil himself. And the devil, I, I'm always taken by the analogy that St. Ignatius uses of the walled city. Obviously, St. Ignatius from Spain and was a military man, uh, speaks in kind of military terms at times. And he, he's speaking about the walled city and that the when the evil en enemy wants to attack the walled city, that he literally goes around the city to try and find the weakest point. And when he's found the weakest point, he will attack that point until he gains entry into the city. And I'm always taken by that analogy because I think it's very true for ourselves because um, the evil one will always try to find our weakest point and especially attempt us when we're at our weakest and most vulnerable um, and he will plant the seeds of doubt and distraction into our hearts at those, at those particular times. I remember when I was doing my spiritual director's course and training, one of the exercises that we were given is a very simple one, but I always stuck in my mind is that if you were to plan your own downfall, how would you go about it? You know, like if, like, what, where's your, where's your own weak points? And it really got me thinking about, well, well, actually, where is my weak points in my life? That if I, if I really was to plan my own downfall, how would, I, how would I go about it? And it really kind of focuses my mind, focused my mind at the time, and I still focus my mind about where am I vulnerable? Where am I weak? Where are my most vulnerable with regard to what the evil one does? I think it's also important to say here that the evil one only has the power over us that we have. We give him ourselves. So if we're aware of the power, that's why I think people have to, you know, there's a line in the scripture where you have to be as cunning. You have to be very cunning with your enemy almost, like the enemies um, about how they approach things, that we have to be cunning as well and be be really aware of, of how the evil one works in our lives so that we can be on our defensive and be and see him in action and say, okay, well, look, we know that's the, that's the um, voice of the devil now we're speaking. Um, I often think of it in, in terms of planting seeds, in some ways, if we're feeling a bit vulnerable, that the evil might just plant a little idea in our head that, you know, you're useless or you're going to be a failure. And it just walks off and leaves that seed in, in our hearts, you know, and then we, we think, God, I'm a failure. I'm useless. I'm no good. Uh, like God really wouldn't love me. And I'm no, I'm, I'm, what good am I now to the Lord now? And what good am I to spiritual life? And that's we then catch the ball and run with it ourselves and if we're only be aware well actually this voice is not coming from god this is the voice of the evil one saying that i'm no good that i'm useless because god would never say that to me um even an awareness of of those kind of thoughts in our hearts can be enough to say okay i can i can reject that i don't have to i don't have to carry that ball i can leave that one down and that's not coming from the lord so i think it's partly as i said before it's about trying to negotiate the spiritual life ourselves and trying to learn as much as we can so 
that we can help others on that journey of faith and journey of development. I often think that the gifts that God gives us through prayer are not for ourselves, they're always for somebody else. Yeah, that that encounter in prayer, I mean, the, the thing is God loves us so much. If we are experiencing that sin or we we have this false identity because we feel we've been labeled with this sin, I'm an adulteress, I'm into pornography, these are all the bad things about me. Again, God sees the pain that got us there, and he wants to heal that. Because those lies, it's allowing even more sin to hook into us. Absolutely. I, I'm, always, I'm always struck by the uh, Adam and Eve in the garden, that when they finally succumb to the temptations of the evil one and they eat from the fruit, the first thing that happens is that they realize they're naked. And that's what happens when we sin. We become vulnerable and weakened. And the more weakened and vulnerable we become, um, the, more, the more fragile that we become, the more self-absorbed we become as well. We, in some ways, we almost wallow in our own self-pity and, and our sadness of our sinfulness. And the more we do that, the more susceptible we are to sin again and to continue on in sin. And plus the fact that if you have given into a certain temptation, that it, like unless you decide to go to confession immediately, there's a temptation the next day, especially if we're talking about pornography or that kind of thing, uh, to, well, I've sinned. Anyway, so look, what, what's another sin got to do? You know, it's not going to, like it's not going to do any more harm, is it? I've already done the damage almost as it is. So we can almost become, we can uh, give ourselves permission to sin again, you know, and allow ourselves to enter deeply into, more deeply into sin. And I suppose our sinfulness does rob us of our dignity, it rob us of our peace, it robs us of our ability to be free. And one of the things about this is that uh, if we go back to that sin of pornography, it's so pervasive that it almost, even when almost uh, convinces that we'll never overcome it. And we have that, our thoughts, well, look, I'll never be able to overcome this because this is, I've, this has become so habitual in my life and I can't see a way out of this. So I just have to, to live with it in my life. And well, actually, the truth is with God's grace, everything can be overcome. And everything can be free. You, you can gain freedom from everything if you're you deliberately open yourself up to the Lord, His grace, and His healing and His peace. And that means when you go to your prayer life, and if you are grappling with, for example, don't be laboring the point here, but if you're grappling with something like pornography, for example, is that when you go to your prayer, that you're completely honest with the Lord in prayer and you share it with Him and share that that struggle. What what are you looking at? What effect it's having on you? How it's how it's affecting your your own self confidence, your own self belief, and the effect that that pain is having on your life, and the way you view other people, and the way you view yourself. Uh, so you have that discussion with the Lord, and you then invite Him in. Look, whatever is really really vulnerable in my life that's causing me to go back to this sinful behavior, please, I ask the Lord to to free me from this. I suppose you don't think say we a sin like pornography, or it could be anything, is we. It becomes, it does become habitual, and we something that becomes habitual becomes more difficult to overcome, and so we have to put as much effort into overcoming. That's where grace builds on nature. That we have to. It takes effort to say no. I'm not going to switch on the computer today. It takes effort to say no. I'm not going to go there, and it takes effort to avoid temptation. But it can be done, and I suppose that's where prayer comes in. Prayer gives us that deep sense of inner strength and peace. And I suppose to say in this in this instance here, also uh, fasting is important as well. And that if we can say no to the things that we enjoy in life most um, over a period of time, then we we can uh, it, it builds up a fortitude in ourselves. You know, it's interesting. You brought up Saint Ignatius of Loyola, and I remember reading where he talked about how sin can surround us in some ways, or the the voice of the enemy can surround us in some ways, and. It's important to have those times of quiet because it will assault us, the noise and the distractions. I can't imagine what St. Ignatius would say about the time we're living in right now because those moments of silently walking a path from town to town, or even from your home to church, we don't have those quiet times because we fill it with sound. Whether you get into a car and then you immediately put on the radio, now we have phones, smartphones, which in some ways there's a good because there are many who are listening to us now through this mechanism. But unfortunately, it's been shown that even a smartphone, the constant scrolling through it and looking at it actually 
causes dopamine levels in the brain to go up. It, you become physically, literally physically addicted to the constant use of that constant input. Those types of addictions, whether it, it's a phone or it's alcohol or it's gambling, or the, I don't mean to belittle it and I say in all reference, but I mean those things that are the classic ad- uh, addictions that we think about. There's a whole other panoply of addictions these days that we're not even aware we've, we've gotten sucked into. Absolutely. But I think you're, you're completely right in saying all of that. And you've given a very clear picture of the world that we're living in today. But I would still say that even in the midst of the busyness and the noise and the temptation around us, that it's possible to begin to cultivate even a small amount of silence in your life and in your heart. Like, as you said yourself, smartphones are very, very helpful. I have one particular app I use in the morning time for prayer where I find very helpful on the smartphone. And uh, I put away the phone then and I continue on my own prayer. But it's um, so it can be it can play a very strong role. And as you say, finding information on how to pray and that can come through the internet too so we can it can be very helpful but i remember was it last lent i decided i would cut my use of the internet and the mobile phone to a minimum and i remember one particular day getting on the bus into town and i decided to leave my phone in my pocket and i was just taken by the fact that everyone else on the bus had a phone out to scroll into a screen and I was on the mm-hmm. top deck of the, of the bus. And as I come in down, the, the bottom deck was full, full of people and everyone. I was looking down at screens. That's the only way I could describe it. But I had decided myself that I wasn't going to do that. And that I know it takes courage because, you know, I said, am I the only one, one left, the other one out here, you know. Um, but I realized that if I don't do it myself, if I don't take, take responsibility of myself for my own spiritual life, I can't expect the person next to me on the bus to say, look, you need to put your phone away into your pocket because you need to do a little bit of quiet time for yourself. Um, so I need to start doing it myself. And I'm always struck by the fact that I know St. John Paul II in Krakow, when he was Archbishop of Krakow, would sometimes go down to the train station and sit and pray there. And he said the noise around him reminded him or played a very strong backdrop to the peace that was in himself. He'd cultivated a peace within himself. So even in the midst of a noisy world, I think it's not to give in, given to defeat here and throw in the towel and say, oh, look, I'm never going to find peace in this. I'm living in a busy world of a busy schedule. We all have busy worlds. We all have a busy schedule. But I think it's about saying, well, actually, in the midst of this busy world, in the midst of this busy schedule, for my own spiritual well-being, which will also affect my mental health and my also my physical health, because these are all interconnected, that if I can decide myself in the car when I'm going somewhere, I'm not going to switch on the radio. Or instead of sitting for the night in, in front of the television, I'm going to switch off the television to sit there with the Lord for, for a quiet time. Or I'm not going to look at my phone as I go in on the bus or on a train or, or fear even on a plane. I find, now, I find myself now when I'm on a, on a plane, actually, it haven't been too often recently, but um, taking out the rosary beads, even saying the rosary and even just taking some quiet time with scripture. That in places you think, well, an airplane is very busy and there's people, um, like I'm always in uh, steerage, as they say, on a plane, so it's always very busy there. And, um, you know, it, you're surrounded by noise, and yet, even in the midst of all that, you can still carve out something for yourself. And I, I, the way I look at it is that God craves my attention. He just is just waiting for me to calm myself down and to look towards him. And the only way we can learn to calm ourselves down is by doing it, you know, and just trying to say, okay, I'm going to give this time. I'm I'm not used to the silence. I'm not used to being on my own in this. I'm used to switching on a radio or TV, but I'm actually going to try. And even if it's only for a few minutes each day, and um, switching off the radio or the television, um, but obviously not discerning hearts that calm. You wouldn't switch that off. But, um, you know, it, <laughs> you'd basically, you know, you'd have, you'd have some time that you just say, okay, I'm going to do this. Um, so I suppose to, to make a long story short, I'm encouraging people who are listening today to have courage around this and to to see this as a priority. I know Saint Faustina, one of the great saints of mercy, always says that God speaks the language of silence. And if we want to understand what God is speaking to us, we have to be silent ourselves. And if we want to get to heaven, because that's like we have to learn the language of prayer on earth. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, I think it's it's just important to say that it can be done. You've been listening to The Heart of Prayer with Father Amon Bork. To hear and or to download this episode, 
along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com, or you can find it within the free Discerning Hearts app. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission, which is to offer authentic and rock-solid spiritual formation freely to souls around the world. And if you feel us worthy, please consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible, to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope you will tell a friend about DiscerningHearts.com and join us next time for The Heart of Prayer with Father Amon Bork.